All right. All right. So thank everybody muted and we will get started. So welcome and thank you everybody for coming this evening. We appreciate it. It is the week of the young child and um, Brooke and I have been doing these child care matters co community conversations throughout our county um, over the last month and we'll be continuing those um, through the rest of the month and we figured that this would be a great opportunity to also engage everyone across the state with this. So you have this information and we encourage you to put together presentations like this um, for yourselves and if you're kind of close to us, Brooke and I would consider coming um, and doing one in your communities with you as well. But we would, um, just like we've been doing in our county, we've been having local um, child care business owners also up here and be our guest hosts so that you can talk about the actual um, problems and barriers within your own communities. So with that, I will pass it off to Brooke so she can introduce herself and we can get started. Thank you. Thanks, Karine. Sorry, I was just uh, trying to shove my face full of food quick. Just got done working. Of course, pickup was late again, um, as I'm sure many of you are used to. So Karine and I have been working together for basically almost 10 years in child care. Um, we started our advocacy initially more towards children with disabilities or special needs. And during COVID, it kind of changed to where it's just kind of like survival mode for child care. And so we wanted to create more of an environment where we can speak um, our minds, basically, and um, talk about the issues that we see and try to encourage improvement across, across it. Um, <clears throat> so we can, it's just Karine and I. <laughs> And um, the trainings that we do, it's just us. Um, we we don't have any funding, which is kind of a good thing because then we don't have, um, like we're not contracted with DCF. So if there's an issue there, we will call it out. Alexa, if there's an issue someplace, turn on the you know, living room. we'll, we'll um, work through these things and try to work together and bring awareness throughout the state. Um, so that's what Karine and I have been working on, and I am a co-owner, director, and teacher at a group child care center. And I don't know if Karine mentioned, but she's family child care program. All right, should we get going? <clears throat> yep, we can. I was trying to get some people uh, checked oh, in. Oh, I can wait. No, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. So we know that 90% of brain development occurs before the age of five. The, the years that we have these children are the most critical years for determining the type of person that they will become. I always say that the most important teacher in your life is the one you don't remember. Um, we have the opportunity to essentially make or break these kids, um, and hopefully we are making them. We are creating relationships with them that show consistency, kindness. Um, we're teaching the children how to self-regulate, how to how to handle their emotions um, and what those emotions are even. So what we do is so critical for our communities. And unfortunately, we're not seen as critical for the communities. So we'll go on to the next one, please. So this is a little video made by the um, at Harvard, the developing of the um, young child. So this this kind of talks about why child early childhood is so important. And I think one of the key takeaways is that it is not just important for the families, the people that have the children. It's important for us as a community. So when people say like it's not my problem, your your kid, your issue, um, it is everybody's problem. So this this kind of illustrates that. Okay, I'm gonna play and let me know if the sound is not working. Is it working, Brooke? The early childhood brain development story has been a powerful influence on the growth of investments and in programs to promote early learning and enhance school readiness. 
but the brain does not exist by itself. Connecting the brain to the rest of the body is critically important. Early childhood experiences are as much about lifelong physical and mental health as they are about early learning and readiness to succeed in school. All biological systems, all of them are highly interconnected and all of these systems are primed to adapt to whatever the environment would throw at us. Think about this. As a team of highly skilled athletes, each has a role to play, but they depend upon each other. They influence each other's responses. Like any good team, it's how they operate together that is the key to their success. When we are stressed, every cell in the body is working overtime. The brain is the master control system that detects threat and then manages the response of all of the different systems. It sends signals to the cardiovascular system to increase heart rate and blood pressure. Signals are picked up by metabolic systems to increase the availability of blood sugar to provide more energy stores for the body. The immune system is activated to be on alert for the possibility of a wound or the need to protect against infection. The neuroendocrine system is activated to increase levels of stress hormones in the bloodstream. All of these also provide feedback to the brain. The stress response system was designed to deal with an acute threat or challenge. But when the stress continues at a very high level, then these biological responses actually start to have a wear and tear effect on the body. This is where stress explains chronic disease. The science is really clear. The most costly chronic diseases in our society have their roots in early childhood. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and depression, three of many diseases that are associated with greater adversity early in life. Those three diseases together consume more than $600 billion of healthcare costs a year. So if we want to think about preventing disease and promoting health, it doesn't begin with exercising more and eating better when you're 30 or 40 years old. Health promotion and preventing disease begins prenatally and it extends into the early childhood period. Connecting the brain to the rest of the body has very important implications for early childhood policy. If we look at the basic science-based principles focused on early learning, strengthening relationships, building skills, reducing sources of stress, those are the same principles that increase the likelihood for lifelong physical and mental health. And when we think about the major sources of adversity early in life, we talk about poverty, discrimination, exposure to violence, maltreatment, child abuse, and neglect. Although each of these sources of adversity differ from each other, biologically, the effect on the body is the same. Systemic racism, the dangers of implicit bias, and everyday discrimination impose a level of stress and adversity on families of color raising children that is present all the time. It's never too late to make things better, and we are biologically prepared to adapt to whatever environment we live in. But we need to look upstream at more systemic issues that are the sources of this enormous burden of threat and hardship. We have to connect policies and resource allocations from the educational sector and the health sector and the human services sector. Pediatric primary care is the one domain where almost all children are seen from birth on and provides a critical opportunity for engagement with families and developing relationships, promoting healthy development, and is the ideal frontline opportunity to connect families to needed services as early as possible when they can be most effective. Pediatrics alone is not going to provide all of the supports that many families need. The opportunity is to move away from asking how do we connect pediatric primary care to early childhood programs and in a different way change our mindset to say how do we build a new early childhood ecosystem in which pediatrics is an integrated part. The brain development story has been a powerful influence. The same principles, the same concepts are also affecting the early foundations of physical and mental health that will last for a lifetime.
Look. Brooke, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. No, um, that's okay. I was trying to let you know. There we go. Thank you. Um, so part of the reason why the first five years are so critical is because unfortunately, a lot of children experience ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. ACEs can be anything from um, violence in the community, um, addiction in the home, abuse, neglect. It can be death in the family. So it, ACEs, the adversity can be a lot of different things. Um, unfortunately, the more ACEs you have, the more difficult your life may become. Um, if you, all you know from, you know, your early years is um, yelling or screaming and um, not feeling loved, then that affects you long term. That's not something that you can just, you know, brush off and, and say, you know, too bad, I'll just do this. So it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, and it, as a video showed, it's what causes a lot of those issues with chronic disease that we see. So that's one of the reasons too, why, why as a community, when we don't take care of our children, we do pay for it later, um, either that way or in our criminal systems too. Um, we are fine to, um, you know, pay 700 and some dollars a day for juvenile detention, um, the daily intake, which is what it is in Wisconsin. Um, but we will not support early child care. Early child care is not even a line item in the budget. Um, so when children are experiencing these ACEs like poverty, which in Wisconsin, children are the highest demographic in poverty. So clearly it's an issue. Um, we need to do something about that as a community. We can go to the next one. Thank you. Um, so there are things that we can do. Some things that, like a death in the family, those are things we can't prevent, but we can do things to try to buffer when children are exposed to poverty, things like that. And the research has shown the one thing that we can do is provide one consistent relationship for a child, one person that they can count on, one person that is loving, that shows them maybe that we don't have to yell to communicate with each other, a person that shows that they care, that can buffer a child against what they are experiencing in other areas of their life. And that is that is critical at trying to help some of these children out to try to give them more of an opportunity in their life instead of closing all the doors, we're trying to open a window for them. <clears throat> and we have to remember that a lot of these, um, that especially the poverty, are things that we're choosing to do with our policies. So with the American Rescue Plan, we were able to take about 50% of people out of poverty because of the extra expanded child tax credit, the child care tax credit, and the um, the increase in food and um, health care for everyone. And then now that those things are all ending, we are plunging people back into poverty because we're making those choices. That was the one thing that did not get through um, with the Build Back Better was the the actual people portion of that. So we have to remember too that our budgets and our policies are reflective of what we as a society value and what we as a society want us to invest in. And we have to be able to communicate to our elected reps and be informed voters so that we way we can hold them accountable and remind them of the things that we want them to invest in and how the lack of investment is actually affecting our communities. And, you know, especially our rural areas, we're seeing more and more people move away because they're just, our schools are, you know, fall, you know, our schools can only increase property taxes on themselves, you know, so many times before they uh, they outprice people from their homes and they can't afford to stay there because of the property taxes. And it's there's the jobs are leaving and things like that. So really, we need to look at building our economy from you know the bottom with our families and our communities all the way up, and making sure that everyone gets has the resources and supports that they need in order to to be successful. And that will help also with a lot of these ACEs and things too, and making sure that people don't have them. Thank you. So this is a, a really good illustration, I feel, on the effects of um, 
of ACE as the adversity and how it affects you. It's not just something that's um, in your mind. I mean, well, obviously it's in your brain, but it's it's physiological. It affects us. Um, so this is a, a three-year-old brain of a normal and a three-year-old brain scan of an, a, a little girl with extreme neglect. So what would we have for expectations for the child on the right? Should we expect the child to do well in school, to grow up, to be successful contributor to society? Um, this is a three-year-old whose opportunities through no fault of her own has been set on a trajectory of struggle where doors of opportunity are being closed on her. And this is where the silver lining is that we can try to help her. We can try to create a relationship to counter what she has experienced. Um, something with extreme neglect, I don't think we would ever be able to give her the same opportunities as the, the next person, but we can certainly try um, to, to give her as much as we can. But unfortunately, we're not doing that. As Karina had mentioned, um, you know, our, our policies, we're throwing children right back into poverty. So that is why the quality relationship can buffer against these adversities. Just having that one person that they feel safe with and providing positive experiences. Uh, many times the childcare provider are spending more waking hours than their parents. And I'm sure many of us agree with that. Um, therefore, we have that opportunity to provide a quality relationship. We can show love, show that a relationship does not um, need to be negative. We can give them that consistency, and we can also teach a child resilience. And that's a key thing is teaching resilience, especially for children facing adversity. Um, the power and influence of this relationship is demonstrated by the fact that quality early child care has a return rate of around $14, $16 an hour. Um, so that means for every dollar spent, that's the rate of return. And that's a good investment for a government to take. And incidentally, the higher rate back, the younger the child. So a one-year-old will bring back um, the rate of $16, where a five-year-old might be on the lower end of $12. So quality, when we can provide quality early child care, it increases the, the success of a child in school, the likeliness to graduate, to go on to college, um, to have better health, better paying jobs. Um, and it decreases when they experience quality early child care, the needs for public services and public assistance. Um, and it increases when you have better paying jobs, it increases our tax base. Um, so it's, it's really good investment for the community when we do take care of our youngest. We can go to the next one, please. And then how much did you say our budget um, put into the penal system last time, two years ago? Speaking of for return the, on investment. For the, for the daily rate intake? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was like 740 something that they, so it was at a joint finance committee, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there was a request for funding early child care in our state, which we don't do. And at that same meeting, Funding early child care was turned down. That was not done, but they did approve the seven hundred and forty some dollar increase um, for the daily rate intake of a juvenile. And so, instead of being proactive and preventing that child from doing, you know, a thirteen year old stealing a car or doing whatever, um, there's a reason why that child is doing that. We have to look back and think what has happened to this child. What were the early years like for this child? But unfortunately, um, we're we're a society that's very dismissive of it, and a lot of that dismissiveness is because our government doesn't support it. So, unlike the K through twelve system that is funded, we are missing out on the most critical time of education by not funding it. So, um, when we look at this side, that's where we look at. Um, knowing that how critical this is. So then we look at Wisconsin does not put it in its economy. Um, the early child care, the average before COVID was $10.66 for the wage. And yet over 50% of us have an associate's degree or higher. So that, um, you know, that's, we're one of the lowest paying fields in Wisconsin. Dog care workers make more than we do. 
um, by a significant amount, or even high school um, dropouts make more. What do they make, Kareen? Um, it was uh, eleven dollars and seventy four cents. So even if you did not have a high school degree or a GED equivalent, you were making about a dollar more an hour than we were in our field. Yeah. So when we think about that, I like to compare it to that K through twelve teacher. Um, imagine if our K through twelve teachers are making twelve dollars an hour with no benefits, because most childcare we don't have benefits either. So what would our expectation be for our education system? For turnover rate, I would bet it was would be very high, just like early child care turnover rate is high. The quality of the education would be low because there's not going to be that consistency. And it's it's really difficult um, to not get burnt out when you're working multiple jobs because you're making $12 an hour. Um, so it's it's ridiculous that we don't do this. And we're one of the um, only industrialized countries that do not support early child care. We are only rated above Croatia. Uh, several years ago, we used to be above Turkey and Croatia, but we've gone down that. Um, our country spends 0.3% of the gross domestic product on childcare. That's it. Where others that are highly rated are at like 0.9.7% of their gross domestic product. So that's a, that's a huge issue for our economy. Our workforce is not going to be there. Um, I think it's something like 70 or 80% of those graduating from high school are not able to join the military. They do not qualify. Um, and a lot of that, that's why the, the military wants us to support early child care. And they do within, they actually do a great job within, within their um, agency, but we don't as a, as a state do that. Um, fortunately with, child care counts, we were able to move the wage up a bit. Um, it's still not what it needs to be. It's 12, 12 something an hour is the average rate now because of the child care counts funding, which is set to expire the end of this year, which we will talk about um, a little bit later on that. Um, so this is this is how we're, we're treating um, the most important person in a person's education. Um, and at the same time that we are making, you know, minimal funds, our families are being charged high tuition rates. And it's it's because the the business um, plan for child care, it doesn't work. We shouldn't have to depend solely on a parent's income for the tuition. Research has shown that we should only be spending 7% of a household income for childcare, regardless if you have two children, three children, one children. Right now in Greene County, for one child, we are paying an average of 19% of the household income for childcare. That's a lot for a lot of people, it's more than their mortgage. It's preventing people from being able to work. It's preventing um, people from from children from having quality care where they may be shuffled to grandparent, neighbor, friend, um, and have that inconsistency because parents can't afford to pay any more than they are. We already exceed what it would cost to send a child to college in the state. So the, the, the answer has to come from our government. It can't come on the backs of our families and it has to stop coming off the backs of us because for too long we have accepted the wages as they are. Um, and this also creates that inequality in our system as well. Um, Wisconsin is, is also one of the worst states for education equality, which is unfortunate, but this is starting at birth because only wealthy or upper class are able to access a lot of the quality early child care because they know the research putting their child in quality care will set the foundation for a better future for that child. People who do not make as much money or are living in poverty don't have that access to quality child care. And their children sometimes are starting a year or two behind the others. And research shows that when you start kindergarten where you're at, if you're above or beyond, usually that stays stagnant. Um, and that's not good. So that is why we need to um, fix this, this inequality of a system that we have. 
We can go to the next one, please. So these are just some um, some headlines that I've taken out just to illustrate to people watching this like that. This is not just Karina and I like being dramatic or um, that this is a serious issue and it is significantly going to affect our economy. So think back when COVID first hit and all the schools shut down, we were asked to stay open. We were provided less regulation so that we could take even more children in a small space. So what does that say about our lives? Because we closed down the schools because we didn't want to risk, you know, the teachers' lives and, but, you know, childcare, take the kids, get those essential workers back. And it was difficult. Um, the, the hospitals and nurse, everybody was struggling because they didn't have childcare and we are declining. And we have been declining for 10 years and COVID exasperated that. So what we're talking about here isn't um, isn't just Kareen and I <laughs> being ourselves. And just, we are one of the slowest ones to come back of all mm -hmm. of the different um, segments of society and sectors of society, which then is impacting in a multiplier way with all the other people being able to go back to work full time or re-enter the work um, field. In Wisconsin, traditionally about 70% of women um, work with, or I should say two income households, 70% have both people working. It's even higher for a single um, parent household. But because of COVID, that's actually dropped in our state to about 66, 67%. So that 3% of people wants to go back to work, but cannot. And the same thing happens once kids go to kindergarten, 95% of dual in, of households go up to dual income. So of that time when children are really young up to the age of five, some of those parents can and should be able to stay home if they would like to. But far too often they are forced to stay home because they can't find care, they can't access care, they can't afford care. Or, you know, and a lot of times we've got parent, grandparents now that are quitting their jobs and retiring early or going down to part time so that they can help their children out with their grandchildren. And these same women have been the ones that when we were born, you know, my generation, when we were born, they stayed home with us. So these women have put themselves on the back burner multiple times and they have really hurt their um, retirement. And now that's happening again with this group of um, young parents because they're not able to work and you know, work their way up the ladder, get different jobs, take opportunities, education, and all those different things that help you then um, have a higher income later on. Also remember when people have children, they're at the beginning of their career. So they're making a very small amount compared to those parents who are able to help their children go to college. When you're paying for those college costs, you have a good 15, 20 years under your belt at your in your career. So you're making a lot more money and are more able to afford that. So before we go on to this next part, did anybody have questions about the importance of um, early care and education and relationships or comments that they wanted to share? Either put it in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go to this next part. I'm gonna move my little thing because I can't read what it says. All right. So over throughout the state of Wisconsin, we need more slots to meet the demand for child care. We annually lose our, which is our local economy, 4.2 to $6 billion in the state, which is up 3 billion, from 3 billion in 2019. That equates to approximately 117,000 more slots are needed. And these losses, this dollar amount comes from household impacts, business impacts and tax revenue impacts. Because remember, if a household is making less money, they're paying less in taxes, they're also able to spend less on local businesses, bars, restaurants, retail stores, purchasing homes, purchasing vehicles, you know, all niceties, vacations, travel, or, you know, just your day-to-day -day living expenses of groceries and things. And then that in turn impacts those business revenues, which then in turn impacts that tax revenue. Um, the source is www.childcaregap.org. I was going to try and go to that website, but it has been struggling the last few days. So I don't know if they're updating it, but that website is a really good website. It has 35 states, Wisconsin's included, and you can actually go down to the county or the local level. You can also look at our congressional district so that when you're advocating, you can look up your specific information. So when you're talking to your representatives, you can tell them. So like Green County, which is small, about 26,000 people, we lose 
about um, 27 million annually, and we need 850 more slots. So this, it's huge in every single um, county. So that's a great um, resource for you. And I'll make sure to send that out to, um, with the um, information tomorrow. And so what we're doing, so child care counts is what the state did with the American Rescue Plan funding. And there were several of us that I think are even in this room um, to, right now that advocated to ensure that the uh, money that was coming from the federal government was allocated in a good, in a equitable, fair, and also um, consistent way across the state. Some st um, states, they gave out the money in one big chunk two years ago, and that money is now completely gone, where our state, and didn't have any requirements about wages and things things like that. A few states did that, including Wisconsin, because we fought for that and said, no, this money has to be earmarked for the wages of those educators. Um, those of us in the room were very confident that we would pay our educators more, but we weren't so confident that, you know, everybody would have necessarily done it across the state, especially when you're looking at some of those larger corporate type um, child care programs. And so Child Care Counts recognizes and supports the early childhood child care professionals who care for and educate the young children of our county and surrounding communities. They deserve a worthy wage and it directly correlates to affordability, accessibility, and quality of early care and education from birth. Back to those relationships and if there's a revolving door of those educators, the educators may not know um, how to identify what's going on. They might think that a child who is biting is, you know, needs to be expelled because they're biting, not that, that there might be something underlying going on, or even if they do know something underlying is going on, they may not understand how to get the support they need. They may not be able to access it. It's not as great as it should be. So that's something that Brooke and I are still, you know, have been working on and are going to continue working on and we'll be, you know, reaching out to everybody in this room and within we can to ensure that those things, you know, continue to be improved upon. Um, but I think it's three out of four people with any sort of degree in early care and education do not work within the early care and education system. And a lot of it is because they, we're really highly, you know, people look for us and people will actually recruit us to work for their companies because they know that we are hard workers. They know that we're flexible, that we can pivot and that we, you know, are good with people. And so most of us, you know, if we decide that we want, you know, a different job, we can find one within a day if we'd like. And, you know, you can go and do, you know, go stock shelves and make $10 more an hour and have benefits. And you don't have the stress that we're under um, every day as well. And so part of what um, Brooke and I are doing is educating the community on the essential role child care programs are to our communities, both to enable parents to work and to ensure the success of our children's futures by building their brains together, connecting the dots so parents, employers, and childless community members understand how the lack of child care investment personally impacts them. So, um, and I know a lot of you in this um, room are also doing that on a daily basis, working with your parents, educating business owners, going out, um, you know, pushing yourselves to get uncomfortable and, you know, share your stories and write and call. Um, a lot of people will say, well, I don't care. It's not my child, not my problem. But at the same time, they might complain that they're, you know, overworked and underpaid at their job because, you know, there's been two positions that haven't been filled. Well, those two positions probably haven't been filled because there's no child care. Um, I see there's something in the chat. So I'm going to just double check. Okay, we're good. And then Main Street Alliance, Raising Wisconsin, SFTA, WFCCA, WCCAA, the County Workforce Developments, Small Business Development Centers, and the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation have all actually re really recognized and are working hard to get the word out and get grants and um, make sure that, you know, this child care counts continues in the state budget and working at the federal level as well. And increasing public investment to raise those wages and offer benefits, thereby increasing access to high quality and affordable child care. One of the budget asks is to take the Badger Care expansion and also include a public option. So those of us who work in programs or have other jobs that don't have um, health care, you would be able to actually buy into our state's Badger Care system with under the public option, which would be much cheaper than getting a um, a plan from, you know, a different insurance company. And then Brooke and I are working to reintroduce legislation to expand supports for children with special needs after the budget cycle is done. Um, so two, last year, legislation was introduced so that children with special needs that need some extra support either with an aid or having materials 
or um, trainings or things like that would not just be for children with um, special needs at, that have um, shared subsidy qualifications, but it would be for all children. Because as Brooke and I have said multiple times, it doesn't matter what the parents make, we can't charge more because that's illegal, that is discrimination. Um, and, you know, basically what the parents end up having to choose is if they can't find a program that will work with them and include their child, then they will end up having to quit their jobs. And in some areas, then what happens? Are they going to lose their home? Are they going to lose, you know, what are they going to lose on top of what happens with that child and their inability to interact with others and the children that see that this kid now just disappeared? They were naughty, so they disappeared, and that's not okay either. And so we're really working hard to get that to go. If you have um, Republican representatives trying to talk to them about co-signing onto that with um, Senator Hesselbein and Representative Baer, they're reintroducing it because our old reps, uh, retired. both of them retired last year. So we've been working with our new reps um, who are very passionate about um, dis um, people with disabilities and their rights um, to reintroduce that legislation. I just want to add, Corrine, that um, we expel in early child care four times the rate of the K through 12 system. So we are kicking out a lot of two and three year olds um, from our child care. And um, like Corrine said, it's not that we're bad people. It's that we don't have the resources to support these children. Um, it's really difficult to be in a room with six two year olds. And one of them is nonverbal, aggressive, unable to um, follow any type of rules and is a runner, tries to run. And it's really difficult to try to support all the children and keep that child safe along with the others in that room. And um, we've talked about this before, but like my experience with birth to three is I get like one or two hours a month for a child who I have 50 hours a week that pretty much needs a one-on-one -on -one that I know when they go to school, they will have an aid full time. Yet during the most critical time for these kids, we're getting no resources for them and it's, it's not okay. Any questions on any of that? So Main Street Alliance is a group that is relatively new to the state. They started about 10 years ago nationally with the Affordable Care Act. Um, and it's a true small business organization. It is for most of the members actually have 20 employees or fewer and many are sole proprietors. Um, it was established about two years ago. I joined um, very much at the beginning. Uh, Brooke is a member and several, I know several other people within WeCan are members as well. The five main member driven priorities are the care economy, which is child care and paid FMLA, fair taxation, universal health care, access to capital and anti-monopoly. Sean was going to come tonight, but he sends his regrets. I'm going to click on this. Hopefully it works. If not, I'll stop sharing and um, find it. No, oh, did it go? No. Yep. Oh, sorry. Ah, look that. That's not the one I want. <laughs> Can you see it? Hey, everyone. This is Sean Fettaplace, Midwest Regional Manager for Major Alliance. I've been with MSA for about two and a half years, um, based here in Madison. And prior to that, I worked for a couple of members of Congress, worked for President Obama, and um, been in the nonpartisan advocacy space for the better part of the last decade. I was very excited to join up with Major Alliance uh, about two and a half years ago because for a long time, there have not really been, uh, there's been trade groups, there's been uh, organizations based on particular industries, um, uh, there's been a lot of groups to support big business in our state, but having a organization that can help coalesce small business owners from all across Wisconsin to be able to fight for the things that we believe in um, didn't really exist more broadly within Wisconsin. Um, and so, you know, as an organization, we've been around for about a decade. Um, we expanded to the state, um, at least at about two and a half years ago. And since then, we've grown to about 1,200 member businesses. And that includes, you know, folks who are on this call that includes, um, you know, child care providers who are business owners. And it's important to think about ourselves as business owners as we do go about this work. Um, but then there's also folks who are light manufacturers, folks who um, create products, folks who uh, own restaurants, folks who, um, you know, are creators or um, creative folks. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds that 
um, you know, are involved with Main Street Alliance. And so Kareen uh, is on our leadership team and has been very active with us. Brooke's on here. She's been invaluable as an as a as a leader and as a partner and as somebody who really works uh, very hard on these issues. And um, you know, the the core issues that we work on includes child care, but it also includes paid family medical leave which is intimately involved with child care, um, tax fairness, making sure you're not paying more in taxes than Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. Um, you know, uh, you got retirement security, you've got um, um, anti-monopoly. I know there's a lot of concern right now about uh, hedge funds and about big investment groups trying to buy up child care providers as an investment tool and um, can be a bit scary because you have a lot of consolidation happening in the industry as a result of that. It can be very tempting to take it, but ultimately that could make things even worse than they already are. Um, and healthcare. I have not ever come across a small business owner who's thrilled and love their healthcare. And there's a lot who don't have any. There's a lot that are uninsured completely and uh, too many. And it makes me personally very angry because you know our society has failed. We failed to uphold the basic social contract that, you know, we're all in this together, we're all working together. And so for us as an organization, Maestro Alliance, what we're trying to do is to make sure we have that social contract, that we do take care of one another, that we are a brother's keeper, we are a sister's keeper. And so, you know, we are working very hard, both at the state and federal levels, to make sure that's the case. Now, at the state level, we're working very hard on the budget. I was just at the um, Raising Wisconsin Lobby Day yesterday. Um, we are also at the Waukesha Joint Finance Committee hearing as well yesterday. Um, we're going to be at a number of the other ones coming up as well. And there's ways to take action. So, um, Kareen, I'm asking to share our toolkit, um, our upcoming events as well. You'll receive that in an email after this meeting. And you know, join us, join MainStreetAlliance.org. Uh, you can sign up at MainStreetAlliance.org, become a member. There's no cost uh, to becoming a member of MSA. And together, you know, more broadly, childcare is extremely important. It's an extremely important issue. And one of the ways we can build power is to work together, you know, both folks within the industry and then the folks who are impacted, who are parents, who are providers, who uh, are folks that support uh, having robust. Um, public investment in child care. And together, we're going to be able to get child care accounts re replenished. We're going to be able to get uh, budget care expansion done. We're going to be able to get paid family medical leave. We're going to be able to get the things we need, but we're going to need to fight for them. And so I just want to say thanks to all of you for the work that you do, taking care of uh, kids every single day. Um, it is extremely important. And as a father of a six-year-old named Charlie, who I love dearly, um, and as uh, and seeing the differences of quality of care that he received over the course of, um, you know, from the time he was born to the time he was six, uh, we had an opportunity to be at a very high quality center, very, um, that was very well run. Um, and we we're also maybe at some places that were not as on top of things and to see the difference of what investment makes and what compensation does in terms of being able to keep and attract and um, support folks, uh, I think just really was eye opening for me. And so again, just want to say thank you to all of you go to mainstreetalliance.org, sign up there, and I look forward to seeing you uh, real soon. Thanks. And I think I'm gonna have to stop the share and reshare in order to get back. So yep. All right. I'll do that and while we're doing that. So MainStreetAlliance.org, it is free to join. Um, if you can donate, that is fantastic and helpful. But it is, so it's one of the few member organizations of businesses that does not cost you thousands upon thousands of dollars in order to be a member and have your voice um, heard and feel that you are important. All right, hold on, let me get here. And... and back to that. All right, are we good? Is it back? <laughs> okay. 
All right, so the American Rescue Plan had, um, funds child care counts. So that's what has allowed the statewide group center program wages to be raised from 1066 to 1266 an hour. These funds end in January of 2024. Um, without the continuation of the funds, the programs will have to raise rates between 20 and 40% to maintain their current wages in high quality environments. Family child care was, net, was 742 and is now, I don't know yet. I asked a few people today and they never got back to me. Um, from Anecdotally, from what I've heard, most of us have been able to raise our own wages about that two to three dollar marks, if not more. Um, we need you to contact your state reps and ask for $340 million to continue the child care counts funds through June 2025 and add child care to the state budget as a line item. Less will not do it. That means each of us will get less. And it also doesn't account for the increased capacity necessary to meet the need for care. So this $340 million is to continue at the level that we have right now with the exact number of children we have right now and teachers right now and programs right now. I know over the next couple of years, the, the idea is to expand the number of programs and, you know, get PT get capacity back to full capacity and get those classrooms back open and take more children. That will mean that we each get less dollars in order to, because you only have a finite amount of money and you can't just get extra. So making sure that when you're talking to um, your families or if you're a parent or a business owner on this meeting, making sure that you are communicating with your reps that this is going to impact my ability to recruit and retain. This is going to impact my ability to afford childcare. I may have to quit my job. It's a workforce issue for today. Um, unfortunately, that is what's probably probably going to make the most impact in our state as we talk about the here and now and today. Because again, as Brooke and I have said, we've kind of traditionally been more reactive than um, proactive. So whenever you're talking to um, anybody in the rep in, as an elected official, talk about child care counts, um, not stipends, not anything else, but child care counts, because then it's a unified message and they're hearing that that is what we need, because the more of us that say the exact same thing, the better the odds are of that passing and going through. Um, Brooke has created a survey and we sent that out. There'll be a link in this a little bit later. We're trying to get the information together. Brooke can talk a little bit more about her meetings that she just had, but we're trying to get the information to show that we are actually, um, this is serious. We're not being whiny. We're not being dramatic. We're not, you know, talking about an apocalypse soon. It's not going to happen. This is really what is going to happen because now that we have like started to increase wages, that's not something that you can take away. Um, and so that the tuition is probably going to have to get up or some other things are going to have to happen. So Brooke, I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Thanks. Um, Sarah is on, correct, from SF? Yep. Okay. So um, supporting families um, had their advocacy on Tuesday and Sarah had asked if I was interested to, um, to if I would be able to meet. And um, she was able to get me several appointments uh, with Republican offices that are on the Joint Finance Committee. That was kind of my criteria. I said I would do it if if you can get me into Republicans on the on the Joint Finance Committee. And she was able to get me into three, including the co-chair Mark Line. And then I was able to get myself into uh, another one, um, Bourne's office. And um, it was interesting. I, I, the impression I get is that they are not going to fund the child care counts or it will be significantly less. A lot of them said it is not in the budget um, that we have, you know, normally we get zero. Um, they did try to turn the conversation to some other things um, like the Dream Up and Partner Up programs. Um, one of the representatives talked about deregulating child care, which is not what we need right now. Um, we can certainly talk at some point about going over our rules and regulations and making improvements, but um, we're not, we're not going to, I told them we're not going to be here anymore to regulate if you don't fix this. So, um, and one of them, when we talked about, you know, making sure that families have a choice in child care, um, that they can afford it, that it is accessible to them. And he brought up that his wife stayed home with his two children. And, um, you know, I responded, well, that was, that's great that you had that, that option, but most, a lot of people don't have that choice. And he's like, well, how would I explain to one family that we're paying, um, for to take care of another care when they chose to take care of theirs at home, but this other family we're going to pay for. Um, so I had to explain to him how that that is a choice that people can have, and that if we don't do it, we are 
spending tenfold later on. So it's the same, it would be the same as, um, you know, homeschooling and sending your child to school. Like we can, it's, there's choices, but right now people don't have those choices. Um, and it's, it's affecting our economy. So it was, um, it was interesting to have those conversations with um, the four Republicans and knowing that they're all on the Joint Finance Committee. And I do um, agree, Karina and I did talk about it. I don't think they understand the severity that we will be closing our doors. And I don't think they understand that. One of the representatives, when we talked about the teacher shortage, he's like, yeah, well, everybody's got a teacher shortage or not a teacher, but a worker short shortage. And I don't think he puts it together that a lot of the workforce shortage is because they don't have childcare. Um, so it's having those conversations and trying to um, trying to to have them see from our perspective, because I feel like many of them are very um, out of touch with the lives that we leave, <laughs> live. I mean, um, and, um, you know, they they don't understand that they, their household income allowed um, a parent to stay home or to bring in a nanny or to afford really expensive child care. Um, and they I don't think it's they can relate to what what most of us are experiencing. Um, so we definitely need to to let them know, which is why the survey, I feel, is very important because um I, Sarah was able to get me into places where I am not their constituent, and that makes it a little bit harder for, for me to have a voice with them um, as much as I tried. So being able to show the survey and matching with, with the Joint Finance Committee members and say, like, this program is going to close. This is going to close. I even sent a um, follow-up email because if you do meet with legislators, always send a follow-up to thank them for their time and um, included the um, occupations of a lot of my parents, where I said, okay, these, I have, you know, two police officers, one pharmacist, three nurses, two teachers, two, like, of, to let them know, like, if I close my doors, which we probably will have to, because it would make zero sense for us to stay open right now, we, um, like many of you, increase the wages for the teachers, which is still not enough. Um, so I, I'm not going to go back and say like, oh, you, you got to take a $3 cut now. And my families cannot afford a, for my program, it would be 22% increase in tuition. It, those two things do not work out. So what's the alternative? Shut the doors. That's it. And um, our policymakers don't seem to understand that. Again, they are, they seem far removed from it and um, their agenda is not um is not for the youngest in our state and they don't seem to understand how that affects our economy so they definitely need to be hearing from us and the same type of thing too is like we have uh, howard markline is a uh, representative for our Green County. And we've had programs and business owners offer to have him come into their program or make calls and they, they just won't set foot in the door. So that makes it a little bit harder for them to also understand the reality. So if you do have relationships with your representative, Democrat, independent, Republican, please take the time to invite them to come to your business, to come into, you know, in if you're a parent, Go, invite them to come to your workplace and then talk about how you wouldn't be able to be there without your child care program um, as well, because it's all of us working together and not against each other to increase the, the quality and accessibility and affordability, because then we'll get what we need and really making it clear that these are your constituents and your constituents will be calling you because there will not be any care. Um, if you have people going on your wait list, have them call the representatives and say, hey, I can't get child care at this place and I'm number whatever on the wait list be, and let them know and have them tell their employer, hey, I can't find child care. Can you call the, our representatives and let them know that they need to invest so that I can come back to work? Because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take all of our voices.
And so to be clear, we do understand that this isn't enough. These wages and lack of benefits are embarrassing, and we need local and county level initiatives to count, continue to fill the gap until meaningful state and federal systemic changes can be made. So that's where the dream up comes in. But $75,000 is not going to open a new program. It's not going to keep a program open for more than two months. So, you know, those types of, and partner up, sure, if the state wants to pay 75% of a slot and have employers pay 25% of the slot, sure, that's going to be way more than that 300 million that we're talking about. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of it is they don't understand the difference too, that we can't market rate is based off of what we can get. But the true cost of care is about double to triple of what we actually charge. Um, and making sure that that is also very clear. Um, and I, to be honest, like Brooke said, we really need to stop martyring ourselves. And we need to start saying, look, we are worth this. And, you know, until it's painful for too many people, it's going to be terrible for all those who definitely are struggling already. But if that's what it takes to make the changes before we completely implode, I like, where are we at? It's, it's really hard to think about. And so how you can help, this is the exciting part and the happy part that, you know, gets me, um, gets me going. So these are, if you can on your, on your phone, these are actually the scannable, are scannable, um, so that you can do that. Otherwise, I will make sure to put the, um, and um, I'll put the links in the comments as well um, after I stop sharing the screen and then um, go ahead and share this information out. So the question and answers on the petition was um, the Democratic Coalition actually created a um, petition in support of child care counts and they took the time. If you have a Democrat um, for a representative, you got a mail, you got a letter in the mail from them personally signed saying, thank you very much. Child care counts is ending. Um, if you want it to continue, please scan this. And also a lot of programs have been having um, parents as they're coming in the door, scan it and fill that petition out immediately. Um, again, it went statewide because those with Republican only representatives then received the letter from the um, state minority leaders, um, Melissa Agard and Greta Neubauer. And so everybody who receives child care counts should have received this letter with this scannable URL. And what the Democrats are saying is that the NACI um, survey that went out uh, about probably four or five months ago is saying 25% of us will close if this does not continue. Sarah Cazell is on here, so I'm going to um, have her pop up here in just a second. And she's um, working to help you craft written or video recorded testimonial. We are also working really hard to as quickly as possible get you registry credit so that you can um, get credit for your time taken to write or video or show up at a JFC hearing or a town hall or anything like that. Um, Sarah, did you want to say anything? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, quickly introduce myself and um, I'm Sarah Cazell, I'm the Initiatives and Advocacy Specialist at FCFTA. And um, I'm going to throw information in the chat right now with, you know, contact information. Um, and I just kind of wanted to, to um, echo what Corinne just um, said about um, adding your voice to our story collection effort. Uh, we just firmly believe that, you know, one of the most impactful ways to influence public policy is to elevate the voices of real lived experience. I came into this work, I never thought I'd be doing advocates like systems level early childhood work. I thought I'd be providing direct care for my entire life. That was my plan. I did it for 10 years. I always had to have a second job in the service industry, bartend, wait tables at night, work with kids in, in the day um, until I just got really fed up with the system as it is and decided to go find out about advocacy and started working with S SFTA uh, first as an advocacy intern for free and then just kind of um, worked my way into that <laughs> organization. And, and um, so uh, uh, if you want to contribute your voice to our story collection effort, it's pretty simple. It's just a matter of um, meeting with me or giving me your written story and signing a consent form and letting us know mm -hmm. how we should use it. It's totally up to you if you want it on social media, if you just want it sent to your direct reps. Um, you know, there's various strategies to get your voice elevated. Um, and then very exciting, as Kareen just mentioned, um, we did just get confirmation from the registry that we have, our training has been approved and you will, we will be launching it next week. Um, and so uh, we have a, a training put together for two tier credit of uh, a lots of toolkit of put together with lots of different strategies um, for advocating and then um, four additional trainings um, at one hour of registry credit apiece 
for if you made an advocacy phone call or sent a letter, for if you uh, wrote a letter to the editor in your local media outlets about this problem, if you testified at a listening session or a local um, attended a local roundtable or you know, whatever your um, reps are doing in the in the local community to hear from their constituents. Um, and if you invited them to your program or had an in-district meeting or even came all the way um, like Brooke did to, to Madison and advocated at the Capitol, all of those things we will give you register credit for. It's pretty simple. You, um, we will be putting it on our website and we will be sending it out to all uh, weekend advocates. Um, you just basically click a link, fill out a, a quick survey to help us get some data about um, the dynamics on the ground that we will then, of course, incorporate into our advocacy strategy. Uh, and then you have access to the toolkit and um, you just let us know the different strategy you uh, you use. And um, you have April, May, and June to let us know what you did, but it incorporates um, advocacy that happened this entire budget season. So if you already met with someone and told your story in February, you can tell us about it now and we will still give you registered credit for it. So that's kind of the idea behind that. I know as working in the industry, I always was looking for you know, opportunities to do trainings and to get credit for the advocacy work I was doing. And I didn't, there was, it was few and far between. So we, this is the first of many um, registry credit opportunities to come from SFCA for at your advocacy work that we know you're already doing. Thank you, Sarah. That's awesome and exciting that you got the approval to do all those hours. We've been in talks for quite a while about how this was going to work. So I'm so glad that it um, worked out exactly how we envisioned it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, communicate to those joint finance committee members to include child care counts in the budget, show up at their listening sessions. I did pop the links in the chat while Sarah was talking. So there is now, instead of an email, because that now um, bounces back, there is an actual submit form um, that you click on and then you put your information in and then you can um, copy paste what you write up. So I recommend you writing something up in a doc, Google Doc or a Word Doc or some sort of note, copy, like write it up, make it how pretty, make it how you want it to be, and then sub copy and paste it to submit it that way. It goes to all 12 members of the JFC. And remember, the JFC is eight Republicans and four Democrats. Um, two of the Democrats, Evan Goyke and Latanya Johnson, did do a presentation with us um, on how the, how the budget cycle works. So um, we definitely have two people on there that are very supportive. But again, we need that majority. Um, In-person JFC hearings are April 11th in Eau Claire, April 12th at the Wilderness in the Dells, and April 26th, the Lakeland Union High School in Manaqua. Main Street Alliance members will be at every one of those to assist you, along with myself at um, the Wilderness. And Sarah, are you going to all three of them now? Here I am, going to be yes. on the ground doing story collection, prepping if you want someone to practice your two minutes at the mic with before you get up there, um, and just networking with all the people who, you know, devoted an entire day and travel all that way to do testifying and, um, you know, connect with you to augment your, your local efforts and support you in any way we can. And then also we, SFTA has... Um, uh, establish some relationship with those uh, Democrats that you mentioned on joint finance. And if you share your story with us, we're going to also be sending to those offices so that they can do their best to get your stories directly in front of the Republican colleagues on joint finance. So awesome. Thank you. And I'm so Sarah will be at all of those as well to support anybody who's interested in um, adding child care counts to their little two minute spiel. So if you go by yourself, you have about two minutes, they were saying two to three, but it sounds like it was so busy yesterday, they were cutting people off at two minutes. Um, they start at 10am and go until 5pm. They were not at the people that signed up um, even at 8.30 in the morning until 4 p.m. yesterday. So plan on it being all day long and doors, I think, open at seven for each of those. So making sure that you're getting there as soon as you possibly can. It is a long day and we completely understand if you can't make it, but if you can, um, look for myself, Sarah, or other Main Street Alliance members. Um, and so then also this is the, um, the Google form that we can has created to communicate with our partner organizations and the JFC about the actual impacts if the child care counts isn't continued with state funds. Because again, Again, we don't think that they understand the severity of the situation. Does anybody have any ideas, other ideas of things that we could do or things you have done? Um, Corrine, yeah. this is Carol. Um, I spent yesterday um, with Wika yes. at, at the Child Care Advocacy Day. Um, our whole, our center, which um, has 10 staff, which should have 20, 
um, the parents actually gave us the day off to go do this. Um, they, we switched to PD day and 98% of our parents were supportive of the switch, um, which is like remarkable in and of itself. Um, I just want to reiterate to everybody that we had Senator Johnson from she's Milwaukee area northern northern part of of um Wisconsin and then Representative Schneider um from the southwest part of the state they both came and talked and they are Republicans. They're very supportive of child care counts. Um, and they, they couldn't say strongly enough that there is a group of Republicans who don't believe that child care is an issue. And um, after talking to some of, to my two personal reps, that that their plan is to let child care fail, let the floor fall out, and then come and and try to put the pieces together. Um, so they were very like, this is the time to put our pedal to the metal, as they say, and not leave up gas leave up on the gas um because this is going to be be a big fight um they also said as many heartstring stories that you can get to them you know at some point that might hit somebody as a change moment um but it was it was a very very interesting um day day yesterday and I, you know i've been in the field for 40 years and i've been doing this for forever um and some of it was exciting that you know at least they're talking about child care now they're not supportive but at least they're talking to us. So um, I just wanted to let those that weren't, that couldn't attend um, in Madison kind of give what the importance and some of the the um, stuff that, that the two Republican reps, our senator and reps had said that um, of their colleagues. So thank you for sharing that. And it's interesting that they said that and admitted to it um, in a group like that. So and sometimes it's really hard to continue digging deep when it's you know really hard to just keep going. But at the same time, we are so close and we are kind of at an inflection point. And, you know, we need to let them know without actually having to experience what it would be like if the bottom floor falls out um, by getting, you know, as many people as possible to contact as many people as possible writing letters to the editor, make them understand that this is a, this is going to be a one issue voter type thing and that they need to listen or they're going to potentially lose their jobs um, come you know, the next election cycle. Um, and rightfully so, because they're supposed to be listening, you know, you're supposed to listen to your constituents. And if they're overwhelmingly 80, 90% telling you that they want you to invest in this, that's not something that you should be able to just ignore. Um, and so making sure, again, like you were saying, Carol, get those, you know, get those stories of, you know, those you know, parents who can't find care and had to quit their job and sell their house or, you know, the grandparent who ended up having to move in, you know, things like that are what is going to actually impact because they need to see the reality of it. Um, and I don't understand why us saying that we're losing $6 billion a year is not enough to invest $300 million. But again, um, it's that same thing of it's for the workforce behind the workforce people. It's not that people um, are lazy and don't want to work. It's that they cannot work because their kids don't have a place to go. And it's not that we're lazy and don't want to work. It's we can't afford to live and work and continuing at this rate of pay and the hours and the stress that we've been under. Anyone else? Right. And I think and I think the reason 
part of the reason that that Johnson and Schneider not only admitted that, but um, but are as supportive is because they have daughters who cannot find childcare, and are so they're right in the thick of it's real to them. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I don't think it, I don't think you mean Senator Johnson though, because that's Latanya. No, and from, she's um, yeah, from um, up by Chippewa Falls. Okay, I'll look that one up. I thought it was Johnson, mm-hmm. but I'll look it up. He's we up have to have be accurate about who we're gonna, you know, say yeah. hey about. <laughs> right. I thought it was. So, um, Senator Jane, Senator Jesse James, was that it, Carol? And I think that makes sense because I have heard that he's been visiting child care group centers and they've been telling him, look, this, and they're showing him empty rooms and empty classrooms and saying, look, we have wait lists. These classrooms could be full if we had children. So I believe it's just um, Senator James. Anyone else have anything they want to add? So there is another opportunity here coming up. Brooke and I did this last year and it was super empowering and exciting. Um, You can see the pictures from our um, in-person event that the two of us put together in in conjunction with the Green County Child Care Network. Um, It's the Child Care Changemakers National Day Without Child Care. They did it last year on May 9th. It's a Monday. Um, Brooke and I both closed for the morning and multiple of our parents came and spoke at this um, at this event that we had, and they had their kids there. Senator Sprite, um, now Senator Spritzer, who was Representative Spritzer, um, was there. We had two parents that volunteered to speak, but by the end, every single one of the parents that we had there actually got up and spoke in front of everyone. We had our chamber director, a few of um, Brooks' teachers were there. Peggy Hack, who has been working on Worthy Wage since the very beginning, um, she came and she spoke. And um, we had the news there, um, United Way was there, several other people. And so what we're asking for you to do is to consider um, joining us in this day without childcare. We are actually working with um, Sarah Kazell um, and the CCNRR throughout the state to um, get some events together throughout the state. The good thing about the um, child care change makers is that you can participate at the level that you are comfortable with. It goes all the way from, you know, making sure that you have parents that are going to their um, their jobs that day, talking about how they couldn't be there that day if they didn't have childcare, um, to having representatives come in and visit, to having walkouts, to having closures. Um, some places across the state or across the country had giant block parties with inflatables and just really made a fun day out of it. It's not taking as a strike where we are against the parents and against the other business owners. It is all of us coming together to create the change and to lift up our voices. Um, And so what you can do is, I will put this in the chat later too, is that um, the website, you can go click on that and then you can sign up for your area, for your county, for your community, um, for your program. And then they will offer you support. There are weekly Zoom meetings. There is a WhatsApp group. You can get swag. So they'll send you t-shirts and signs and um, banners and all kinds of other great things for free. They have a lot of great, um, they have a lot of great Um, swag and um, funders. Um, Main Street Alliance was a funder last year. NACI was a funder. Um, SEIU was a funder. Uh, Several of the state ACs were also part of it. So um, definitely look at that. And yes, it is Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, That is part of the reason that they do it. They picked that day. It started because last year in Connecticut, the Connecticut um, AC decided to do a strike Um, They almost every single program participated across the state. They showed up at the Capitol with parents and other business owners. And the very next week, they had 20 separate legislative bills 
actually funding for child care. So it worked. Um, if we all can kind of come together and raise our voices, this will also probably be while they're writing the budget. So this would give them a little glimpse of what would happen if um, the bottom fell out. Um, some of the other people that participated last year, Renee Henning, she is up in Beaver Dam. She's the director of community care, preschool and child care. We'll see if this works. This is what she did last year. Is it going to go? All right, I'm going to try it this way then. Where's the chats? Oops, that's not the right one. Sorry. Um. All right. And I think I got it working now. Morning. I just had the first mom literally almost have a heart attack in the driveway and she saw me standing here with my sign that says. Ooh, sorry. This is also on our weekend page. If you go under media, you can find it. It's like we're not close today, but the point of today is to bring awareness to the hard work that child care providers do. If we aren't here, you can't go to work. And if you can't go to work, your employer can't do what they do. So many people just think if the child care providers were all closed and you didn't have us to count on, what would you do? Sorry. All right, so she scared every one of her parents um, as they drove up, she was like, stop. And so she actually had them then sign um, a letter to the representatives and she has Mark Vorn um, as her rep, who is also a co, um, chair of the J JFC. And so they, those parents really got it and they went and talked to their employers that day about it too. Um, and then, oh, hold on, I'm gonna have to do it this way. Oh. Okay. And then Tracy Jensen, um, and she is doing a part, uh, dream up and they have done some programs and things within their county, but she is the program coordinator of Sunny Day Care Child Care in Wapaka, Wisconsin. I believe they are the only group center up there, and there are just a couple family child cares, and they have a wait list with, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of children on it. And so what they did was they had a walk-in for that day. They had parents come in, and they um, filled out cards to send to their representative. They had um, media come, and actually PBS News came, and they did... Um, they interviewed or they did a Zoom with her and they interviewed her. Um, I will play that for you in just a second. But there's a picture of a parent filling that out. They had made, got a giant banner and they did have their representatives come into um, the program as well that day. So let me pull this up. That should work. I try to keep everything very simple with the local ingredients. It's like a few different things. Luke meets a pair of rising chefs in Madison. There's not a lot of people I don't think that could work in like a two chef team you like the that? capacity that we do. And the farm behind the amazing food. You know, the main the enterprise chef, is our dairy goats. They right make in our eyes the best goat oh, cheese it. in the state. All comes together in one beautiful bite. Wisconsin Foodie. Thursday night on PBS Wisconsin. 
We turn now from health care to child care. Monday was a day without child care in which activists asked child care centers to close for a day to bring attention to the need for increased wages and more affordable options for parents. We're joined now by Tracy Jensen, program director at Sunny Day Child Care and Preschool in Wapaka. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Thanks for having me on today. So the apparent irony of your participation in a day without child care is you felt you couldn't afford to close for the day, both for you and your parents. Is that accurate? That is correct. Um, with having COVID these last couple of years, asking our parents to not be able to be open for child care, we thought was a little bit much. Um, having to quarantine out classrooms, we had been asking parents to come pick up their children. Um, so we felt like they didn't have any more days to take off from work. So as a community, um, we decided that we were going to keep our doors open. So what did you ask your, your, your families to do in, in lieu of actually taking the day off? How did they try and participate in this day? So we did a hashtag a day without child care. Um, parents were able to write comments in what they would do if there was no child care at all. Um, we also had parents come in and have discussions with our staff about the importance of child care and quality care. And um, overall, we like I said, we just had them really... We brought an awareness to child care and what is going on right now. Now, it seems like the COVID-19 pandemic brought a new appreciation for child care providers, but did it bring in enough new dollars to actually support everyone? Well, that's a very good question. Um, we are very thankful. We did get fun federal funding um, and we are investing it the best that we can um, to keep us ourselves afloat. Um, but we are definitely concerned about sustainability um, and retention and being able to keep our employees as well as gain new employees. Now, in theory, the laws of supply and demand should dictate the cost and availability of childcare, and perhaps it does for, for wealthy families, but how does that get disrupted when a child care center is serving a working class population? As far as like equality, is that what you're asking? Yeah, in terms of your ability to actually charge what you would think would be enough to provide for fair wages, does that not work in a place like Wapaka the same way it might in a, in a wealthier community or a more populous area? It, it does not work that way for us. Uh, so, so what are you able to do? How do you determine what rates you can set, how much your, your families can afford to pay? So we have a lot of blue collar workers that have their children here at Sunny Day. So that kind of determines how the cost is. And and what, what role do you serve in, in, in that regard? I mean, obviously, you know, it's a service for them to bring to the children there, but if, if you weren't there, would there be other providers that would pop up? Or I mean, you're a pretty large facility, right? Somewhere else in the desert. We are a large facility, but we are also in a desert. So we have quite a few families on a waiting list here. Um, I think right now we are licensed for 220 children. Um, and I think we have over 100 children, 100 families on a waiting list right now. Okay. Now, what so there does... definitely is the need for it. Mm -hmm. What role does the government have to play in this? Do they need to get out of the way or should the government be getting more involved? So are you, I'm sorry, you glitched out. So are you asking, should the government be more involved? Yes. Would you like the government to be more involved to help with this, or should they just get out of the way? Are there too many regulations happening? Government and cost for parents, so enough payments for parents. So we do have, so we, we have share, we have Wisconsin shares, which helps supplement for some of the parents having their children here. But we really need help for everyone overall for cost of child care. All right. Tracy Jensen at Sunny Day Child Care and Preschool. Thanks for your time today. Oh, sorry. All right. And so you could tell that Tracy was really nervous. She sent me a message that day saying that they had called her and they were going to be going to um, 
interview her that afternoon. And so I sent her just a couple quick things. And then she, after it was over, she was like, I couldn't understand him. It kept glitching out. And I feel like I didn't answer the questions as well as I could have. But at the same time, she did a great job. And, you know, she tried to answer the questions as best as she could. Um, but again, it's one of those that as you get more experience and you're able to answer those questions and think ahead of, you know, a little bit more and expecting what they're, you know, going to talk about, it makes it a little bit easier. So one of the suggestions I have is before you um, have somebody like start rolling tape to actually talk to them earlier about what it is that you want to go over, um, what they're looking for, what kind of questions they're going to ask you and what then let them know also what you want to let them know, because then that will help help guide the conversation so that you can be as um, succinct as possible and mm -hmm. articulate a little bit, you know, clearer. And like I said, she did a great job. It was her very first time. And this was, you know, a year ago. And since then she's had some more media uh, appearances and has definitely talked to me about it and said that she feels far more confident. Um, so again, but you have to get started somewhere and for, you know, PBS Wisconsin to cover that, that was great. Um, any questions on that? Leah, did you want to say something? Okay, just want to make sure. And so those are like three of the different ways that people participated throughout our state on that. And I think that is the end of the slideshow. So I'm going to find that other um, link and put it in there. Um, so if anybody's interested in the day without childcare, making sure that you let us know um, and that you go onto that website. And it really is about looking at equity at the core and justice and making sure that all children have equal opportunities and access to high quality care and that those of us that are providing the care have equal opportunities to succeed and to thrive ourselves and not have to, like Sarah said, work a full-time job and then a part-time job. And, you know, how can you meet the needs of the children when you were up until 2 a.m. bartending the night before and you're exhausted? And, you know, you have a classroom of, you know, children that are being children because that's what they do. And it's really hard to meet their needs um, in those situations too. I'm gonna put that in the chat. Anybody else have anything they wanna say? Or any questions? For those that closed, did the centers give notice or if so, how much did it vary? Um, Brooke and I, I think it was about this time last year, wasn't it, when we started organizing? It was pretty quick. Yeah, it was. And we closed um, and met at the park and encouraged our families to join us. We had talked about trying to go to the Capitol, but there was, they, they were gone. or yeah, They had they gaveled were, out in March. Yeah. <laughs> they um, but there. that's an option if, if you're close by, like, um, to, to encourage your families and the children to go to the Capitol if if it works out for you. Um, but try to organize it. Let Like Kareen said, make it a group effort. The parents have to be a part of this um, and even their employers, let them know. And make sure that the parents understand too, if this funding doesn't go through, the the tuition, either what your plans are, if the tuition will need to increase the 25% or what your plans are so that the Parents know what to expect and what's on the line so that they can um, join you in their advocacy. Um, I know that I have the letter that Kareen mentioned earlier from the legislator. I have it right on my front door and with a little post-it that says scan and sign um, to try to, to make sure that all my parents are doing it. And the newsletters, I let them know where we're at with things. So let parents know so we can be on the same team with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we both Brooke and I we ended up opening afterwards. It was what noon did we open? I yeah, think. I think I think that's what it was. Yeah. So and we worked with um so I got the permit from the village park. It was $20. Um we um invited the police department. Where actually the Green County Sheriff came. Um he's a supporter of um investing because he said he's lo looking at losing three or four of his deputies here pretty soon because he has a pretty young staff and he knows that you know a few of them are going to want to have babies and they're not sure what's going to happen um and so we really made sure that we invited like a lot of different a very wide variety of people to it and then we have contacts with the media so we let them know even if you don't know um if you know if you don't have contacts yet with the media send out letters send them send 
emails and let them know, go to their general contact us. Brooke and I sent it to the three main ones in Madison. And one of them said that they would come. A lot of times they do, I think, talk to each other so that they're not all at the same place and they'll kind of rotate who covers some of those different things. Um, your local newspapers, we've been working with our four county. We're very lucky. We have four small newspapers in our county and we've been um, submitting articles every single week now again for about four or five months um, about child care and why it matters to the community so that we're educating and informing um, the people in our area. Um, I do see I a wonder, couple of questions. Green, maybe we can share those articles too on our yeah. weekend so that yeah. people can just kind of see what we're writing about. Um, the letter with the scan code for printing? Yes, absolutely. You're talking about the, J, the um, one from the Dems, correct? The petition? Amy? And then yes, for, thank you. Yep. Okay. And then the general information shows how to figure out your tuition. So if you're looking at how much child care counts um, was part of your um, revenue, so you don't just look at your profit. Don't look at how much you had for expenses. It was how much money did you get in from parent tuition and how much money did you get in from child care counts. Take the number from child care counts, divide it by the number. Um, so add the two together, take your number from child care accounts, divide it by the total, and that was the percentage. So when I did mine, it's 25%. When Brooke did hers, it was 22%. That's how much we'll have to raise our rates to make that up. Um, it's pretty easy math that way. And I, I will make sure that I send that formula out with um, the email. If you're not members of um, our We Can email list, because I did notice there were some new people, um, I will be adding you to our We Can Advocate um, email list. If you're on Facebook, we have a Facebook group called Wisconsin Early Childhood Action Needed. I try to post everything on there. <laughs> there are templates and things that are in um, the files. Um, and Brooke and I last year created some letters. There's also a great resources on the Child Care Changemakers website for parent letters, business owner letters, things like that, that you can just download and use. Otherwise, um, I'm, Brooke and I were going to look at the ones we had sent out last year and tweak, because if you're a nonprofit, you have a board that you have to answer to. So you also have to make sure that your board is on board with you. Um, we had the school board president came and talked um, from New Glarus as well last year. But, you know, again, it was one of those things, Brooke and I have been working with our parents for years, so we had laid the groundwork so they weren't surprised when this happened um, and that we, you know, that we were part of it. And they also are very supportive because they know we're working really hard to make sure that they don't have to pay more and that we are here and open, <clears throat> but yet also acknowledge that we deserve to be paid better. That help? So... And you should have your child care accounts um, from your tax information and your parent tuition. You should have that too um, for your, from your tax information. Um, Angela, you can unmute. Okay, go ahead. Um, you can put it in the chat. I don't think I can override it. Um, I can read what you have. <laughs> Yes, I charged families and paid staff. Yep, I did too. No, well, I kind of took it like a holiday type. <laughs> Professional development. Yeah. And all of my families except one came. I have a family child care, so it was a lot fewer. And the kids, you know, they played at the park. We lucked out. It was like a 75 degree, beautiful day. Oh, and we used um, the library actually had a microphone set that we could borrow from them. So making sure that you're using your local resources too. Um, and, you know, so it doesn't cost you a lot of money. So I just put it in the chat too. I did the easy math. Yours won't quite, you know, add up to a nice round number like that. So anybody have questions about letters to the editor or having um, representatives come in or how to talk to parents? <clears throat> Good 
Karina and I um, will have an article coming out, another one that's more addressed to employers to notify them that if child care counts doesn't go through that um, they're going to need a raise about a 25% raise. So trying to get that, that one is more about trying to get the employers to understand that they need to also call on behalf of their employees um, to try to, to, to have joint finance committee approve this. Um, Cause I agree with what Carol said from, from my meetings. Um, I don't think they're going to do it. My, my thoughts are they're going to do it really low amount. That won't, that won't be enough. I am putting um, a um, letter to the editor that a provider in Monroe wrote, um, and she also invited her reps to come in. And so I'm going to pop that in there. Um, I just got to find it. And then, um, Brooke, can you answer the other question from Angela in there? Because it's um, more geared for a group center director. Sure, let me look. Um, so I have 54 children right now and about eight teachers. Um, Pre-COVID, I had 110 children and more teachers. I forget what I had, but I lost a lot of teachers during COVID and um, never retained them back. So uh, I really think I like to get my centers, my community. Just... Yeah, you can always reach out to me. Um, Karine and I have a lot of um, advocacy papers, templates, things that you can easily use and just tweak a little bit to your to your needs. The same with, honestly, our letters to the editor. Um, I saw that was another one. Like we have, um, when we did a, a similar presentation at my center, um, one of the families that next day wrote a really nice um, kind of article from her perspective, and we put that in the paper. And um, I'm sure she would be more than willing if you know if you want to take a, a parent's perspective, put it in there, or some of the other articles that Karine and I have written, and just you know tweak it to fit with you your situation, your needs. But um, it, it will provide you with the outline of what kind of things you should be putting in there um, and what you can also be telling your parents. Yeah, the, we asked her for a quote and she wrote back two paragraphs and I was like, um, this is more of an actual letter. Do you mind? And she was like, absolutely not. Whatever you, whatever you, I can do to help. Um, and she did give us um, permission to share it with all of you too. So I put that in the chat um, as a PDF, but I can definitely um, put a bunch of attachments on um, the follow-up email with this. And several of them are also on, if you go to the files on our Facebook group, you can find them. And um, the weekend, again, it's just Brooke and I that do all of this. So our website needs to be updated, but that same parent actually now reached out to Brooke and I and asked how they can help. And one is a media person and is going to take over the website for us. So I'm super excited. I can just email him the stuff and he can put it right on there for me. Because again, I'm, you know, I'm working 50 hours with kids. I'm doing all this other stuff. I have two children myself and a husband and I would like to, you know, stay married and stay a mom. So, you know, it definitely, you know, makes a difference and, you know, the amount of time that I have um, and the same thing with, you know, Brooke. Um, so, you know, we both are very also busy, but we're very passionate. Um, but at the same time, we need all the, uh, we do this because we want to empower and lift up other voices because A, it's not just the Karina and Brooke show. We're not the only ones in the state and B, we want, we want your voices because your voices matter too. And, you know, many, many hands makes lighter work. And it helps, you know, it helps keep me going, at least personally, when I see the people that, you know, we've been working with go out on their own and testify. It's, you know, it's kind of like that, you know, like, yes, I'm so excited for you. And I'm so happy for you um, that you took that opportunity. And it's hard and it is nerve wracking. This is not something Brooke and I ever wanted to do. We never went to school for policy. Same with Sarah. She didn't either. Um, but it's one of those things we stepped in it. And it's something that, you know, we're passionate about and finding a little bit of success here and there. Um, but it makes it worth it at the end of the day. It'll really make it worth it if we get child care counts in the budget. Well, the thing to remember too is that we're living <clears throat> it every day. We're with these children. Um, these policymakers are not. So it's it is our responsibility to let them know what it's like, what's happening, and what we need. So it's it's important because, like I said earlier, a lot of them are very far removed from what we do and what child care, what is happening. So we for them to understand we have to share our experiences. 
Can I just say too um, quickly that um, we kind of highlighted the importance of joint finance committee um, because they are the first committee to make major amendments to the executive version of the budget bill. And then, you know, the kinds of changes they make um, typically are like, uh, you know, the, they make the biggest changes to what will eventually be the, um, the version that passes. Uh, but they understand that it's a 16 person government committee and they can't just listen to their own constituents about budget priorities. They need to hear from everybody throughout the state. So um, the legislature pairs everybody in the entire, you know, all reps and senators have a, what's called a budget buddy. Um, and so they're talking about what they're hearing from their constituents to the person that they're paired up with on joint finance. So everybody in the legislature needs to be heard from now. I mean, especially joint finance, but everybody, because your message will make its way to the folks on joint finance. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there just in case anybody um, is concerned that, you know, they live in an area that doesn't have somebody on joint finance, uh, your voice still really matters and it's still, um, it, it's still really effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in Wisconsin, the governor introduces his budget, but the state does not have to, the Joint Finance Committee doesn't have to do it anything with it. And according to an article by the Wisconsin Examiner today, um, as a follow up for yesterday's um, hearings, the Republicans said that they basically are going to start over from scratch, and they can do that. And they've done it the last two times with Eber's budget. Um, interestingly, though, when Walker, when it was the trifecta, they didn't have a budget passed till October because they still were in fighting amongst each other. So it's not like it's because we're divided government. It's because they, they have very explicit ideas of what they want um, and they have to work through all of that. Um, but again, it's one of those things like they still need to listen to us because at the end of the day, we're still their bosses and we're still the voters. And, you know, they need to know that, that we're engaged and that we are paying attention because so much of the time, if you're not engaged or paying attention, they can do those things because we just don't know. And we don't feel that it makes a difference, but it really, really does. Look at what happened Tuesday with the Supreme Court. <laughs> And that is huge because more than likely fair maps will happen by 2024, um, which means that this budget could get interesting because they very well could be thinking about, well, if it becomes fair maps. Sorry, I don't know why Alexa's talking to me. I don't even have Alexa down here. <laughs> um, must be a tablet. Um, but anyhow, um, it could be interesting because there are some um, representatives that know that if fair maps happen, their district is going to be a whole lot more competitive. And so they might be more likely to listen. So, you know, making sure that, you know, we hold them accountable in any way, shape or form that we can, because a 10% win in our state is huge. Most of the time, somebody only wins by one or 2%. Evers won by 3%. And we have a divided, a state treasurer is a Republican. So, I mean, we're, we're a very purple state. But again, childcare is nonpartisan. 80 to 90% of, of registered voters agree that we should be putting funding towards childcare. So any other questions? Joan, were you able to open the um, PDF in the chat? Oh, you're muted. I didn't try okay. yet. Um, Want to make sure that you check oh. that before I close. <laughs> um, it should. So there yes, should. Yes, I did. Okay, so there should be two PDFs: one Niemeyer um, yeah. LTE and one Child Care Matters: A Parent's Perspective. Leah, right. do you see it? I got it. Now it should be if you scroll up a little bit. Then also there is the um, the Google form. I'm going to put that in again. Please, before we'll let you leave a few minutes, if you promise to fill that out. Um, if you are the owner of a group center or a family child care, please click on that and fill it out. That is asking you about um, what's going to happen if child care counts does not continue. It also um, has a few questions about if you are currently a group center that has empty waiting, empty rooms, um, so that we can get that baseline information as well. Leah, do you need me to share those again? I will also make sure I'm going to write this down. I'll make sure to put those in um, the follow-up email too. Any other types of 
I'll put the templates in there too that we created um, for communicating with other people um, that we had made about a month ago for parents and parents to communicate with employers and other business owners. So I'll put those in there too. And anytime we do templates, we try to make them as broad as possible because it is the most effective. I was on a panel yes, uh, Tuesday, Supporting Families Together Association, talking about um, talking with representatives and Sen Senator Andre Jacques and Representative Stubeck, um, I believe that was her name, were talking about how, you know, good, okay is signing a petition. Better is writing, is uh, kind of a, a create a template with your story in it. So whenever we send out templates, we make sure to highlight areas where you need to put your story in because yes, the ask is the same. Yes, the problem is the same, but the story about why and how it affects you is very different. And again, it might, like Carol was saying, it might resonate with one person that, that something else didn't resonate with somebody else. So making sure that you share your stories is extremely important. And best is, you know, showing up in person or having them come to your business, if you can get them in the door. <laughs> Latasha, if I said your name correct. Well, do we have to fill it out now? Um, the form, um, we're, this is scheduled for 830. So if you could, it really only takes about two minutes to fill it out. Because we're going to let you guys go. But otherwise, um, if you you know can't get to it tonight because you're busy, you I understand. The form for family is where? How do we get the form again? It's in the chat. It's the https um, forms gle. If you click on that, it'll pop open in another um, screen. And which one is for family? Uh, child it's the, care it's the same one. There's a spot where you indicate if you're family or group. So is this for us to get credit for this class or? Um, well, it's kind of part of the two hours because we're wrapping up a little bit early. So it should only take you a couple minutes. Does that make sense? Hey, does it have to be filled out in order for us to get credit? No. But it won't help us with the JFC. Yeah, we, we get the impression talking to some legislatures that they that they just, I don't know if they believe the impact, like it's one thing to hear it from me, a state agency worker. It's a whole nother thing to actually have some hard, fast data from people that we just talked to about, you know, room closures and about staffing needs and about, um, you know, what your what the impact is going to be if you lose this and in, in the beginning of 2024. And and we're not going to use any names or business names. It's just going to be zip code and areas in general, family, child care, group center things, um, unless you give us explicit permission. And um, it, there is a, set, a question at the very end that asks if you'd be willing to do some things. Um, and anytime that media reaches out to myself or Brooke or Sean or Sarah, we will connect. We'll ask you first if we can connect you with this reporter about this story at this time. And then you tell us yes or no. And if you say yes, then we connect you so we don't ever give your information out without your permission because I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me <laughs> did you have another question Latasha yes Leah definitely you have to if you have a board you have to include them so that's completely acceptable We're trying to get the information within the next couple of weeks for sure and compiled and sent in. That way there's time before the end of the budget cycle. Any other questions? Comments, concerns? All right, well, we'll give you back 11 minutes of your life. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, Brooke, did you wanna say anything? Um, no, just thank you for coming. And this is recorded. If you want to share it, um, you're more than welcome to, to other community members. Um, again, I, I can't stress how important the job is that we do. Um, so that's why you need to stand up for yourself and the children that we, children and families that we serve. This is, this is very critical for our youngest and, um, it's important. We need to use our voice. So. We teach them to stand up for themselves. We should probably be doing it or, you know, doing it too. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. We appreciate you.